the talking, nagging, lucha watching, puro viewing, indie supporting, drinking, cursing, son of a gun of a podcast. Join former pro wrestler and promoter Dave Dynasty and co-host Ike Isaacs as they talk wrestling and interview those within the business, bringing positivity back to pro wrestling. This is the Dave Dynasty Show. Greetings and welcome to the Dave Dynasty Show. This is your host, Dave Dynasty. Thank you for joining us. And then by whatever means you do, whether it be iTunes, SoundCloud, or YouTube, Please give us a like, follow, subscribe, and share, comment, rate, review. Do all the wonderful online things you can do. We appreciate your support. We appreciate you helping this podcast to bring positivity back to pro wrestling and by supporting independent wrestling, particularly independent wrestling in Indiana and the Midwest. One way that you can do that, we are starting a new project. Uh, we are going to make a video collection, video montage, I'm not sure what you want to call it, of, of wrestlers and fans expressing what independent wrestling means to them. Uh, we want to make this a positive thing. We want to make this a personal thing. Tell your story of, of why independent wrestling is important to you, what it means in your life, etc., etc. Have fun with it. Uh, but you know what? Shoot us a little video. You can do it on your phone. You can do whatever. Uh, you know, it doesn't have to be any huge thing. Uh, and then just send it to you. You can look up Dave Dynasty on Facebook. Send it to me there, or you can email it to Dave at DaveDynasty.com. And if you could, you know, try to get those to us here in the next week before next week's show, and we'll start putting that together and work on it. We wanted to just put this out there as a thing. You know, there's always all this bickering and arguing amongst fans and wrestlers and and all this and that about. What what is what is good? What is bad? What is better than what? You know what? We just want to to do something positive to show that man, this this business is is amazing, and it truly is important, and it is a great great thing. Uh, and regardless of what you like in this business, what style you like, and regardless of of, of your approach, uh, you know we I, I understand things work, and some things don't. But as far as just what you like and the style you like, man, it's it's taste, and it's it, and let's just be respectful of that. Um, you know, I know there, there's been a lot of talk about that here lately, right? I mean, on a lot of exchanges and a lot of, of big names involved uh, discussing the uh, style of pro wrestling and, and, and everything else, and and nobody's right, nobody's wrong. It's just it's like different views of the same piece of art. And uh, and that's cool. That's great. And so what we want to do, man, we just want to get by that. We want to put all this thing out there with some positivity showing a bunch of people in and out of the business in whatever capacity just saying that, man, this is – it's great. And this is a great time to be a wrestling fan. Uh, and we got a great guest today. Uh, he is uh, – he, he has, you know, he has his views and opinions on the on, on the approach to wrestling and, and, and teaching and passing wisdom and uh, – Everything else, we have, uh, you know, he's a great star in, in, in several Indiana, in, Indiana, NWA promotions. Uh, it's the Golden Boy, Greg Anthony, a great, great video, uh, interview today. Uh, you know, going to be classic. You, you're going to enjoy it. Uh, and then stick around after. We got some wisdom from Mance Warner, as we do every week. Uh, let's take a quick break here from one of our sponsors. And when we get back, uh, we will have that interview with Greg Anthony. So stick around. Visit LuchaMaskUSA.com for official high-quality Lucha masks and merchandise straight from the luchadors themselves. They have a huge and always growing inventory, so check back often. That's luchamaskusa.com. And welcome back to the Dave Donacy Show. I'm your co-host, Ike Isaacs, and today I'm joined by a mainstay in Midwest Wrestling, the golden boy, Greg Anthony. How are we doing today? Very good, very good. How you doing? Not too bad, not too shabby. Got a little bit of a technical issue starting with this interview, but we got it going, we got it rocking, so we're just going to hit the ground running. So first and foremost, where are you from, Greg? Uh, from the Memphis area. You know, um, I live north of Memphis, about 70 miles north of Memphis, Tennessee, um, in a little town called Dyersburg, Tennessee. Okay. Uh, I, was actually, I was actually born in southern Illinois, though. Uh, I spent the first, you know, six, seven years of my life in, in uh, southern Illinois, so... I got kind of a, a an interesting upbringing in wrestling. Yeah, absolutely. That, that southern that southern uh, southern wrestling is definitely uh, a good way to be brought up. Though I will say that. 
<laughs> yeah, absolutely. I mean, for me, it's um, Southern wrestling is if you if you think about your favorite wrestler, more than likely they're a Southern wrestler, and if they're not a Southern wrestler per se, they 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 borrow a lot from Southern wrestling. So, absolutely, I would definitely have to agree with that. A lot of uh, a lot of the great, well, not only not not only a lot of the greats have come from uh, that area, but also from the uh, style of wrestling that that is. Uh, you have a lot of great talent and a lot of great uh, move sets. I think you could even say that come from that and stem from that. Sure, absolutely. So, kind of along with uh, how you grew up, we kind of talked a little bit about that. But how with your childhood? Uh, did you play any kind of sports growing up at all? Was there any kind of, uh, you know, I played football, baseball type deal? Um, yeah, like I was always obviously a wrestling fan, but it was always um, I was just as passionate about basketball for a while um, as I was wrestling. So I actually played basketball through um, through junior high and high school. Okay. And um, I, I was very, I'm still, you know, I, st- I still love basketball. I have two kids that are, they're nine and seven, and they're they're eight up with basketball right now. They love basketball too, so I get to pass some of that knowledge on to them. But yeah, I grew up in the in the Michael Jordan era, you know, of basketball. So I mean, um, which to me was one of the greatest times in sports. Period. So absolutely, uh, that's an, that's another thing I can definitely agree with you there. <laughs> so uh, so certainly, uh, you know, I, I hear a lot from people who. Uh, wrestle that you know when they grow up playing sports or and also grow up watching wrestling it obviously instills in you a love for wrestling and a want to do it so what were some of your first memories of being a wrestling fan growing up well that's that's what's kind of unique about myself is that my actual my earliest memories of life not just of wrestling but of life or of professional wrestling my earliest memory that i have is actually sitting on my grandmother's knee watching wrestling and more specifically watching the nwa you know so um that's why it holds such a special connection for me is because you know i grew up you know watching the the flares and the and the arms and the tollies and the dusties and the brad armstrongs and the microtundas and the stings and the rick steiners and the list goes on and on you know absolutely so then, uh, also kind of along those same lines, uh, obviously you probably grew up and you watched probably one of the most vital eras of wrestling, period. So who were you a fan of as a kid? Because I, I, first of all, there were a lot of greats, but if you could narrow it down, who would you say were your favorites? You know, and that's something, too, that's, you know, I, <clears throat> of course, when you're a kid, you know, I, I loved all the good guys and hated all the bad guys, obviously. <laughs> But at the same time, I, I I was always drawn to those seamless southern heels that I end up emulating so much. So for me, it was the Arn Andersons, it was the Tully Blanchers, it was the Bobby Eatons, it was the Ted DiBiase's. Those guys that just, they weren't going out there and doing stuff that seemed choreographed. Everything they did was work. You know, everything they did was spontaneous and on the fly, and it, everything felt real and authentic. Absolutely. So definitely, that that's kind of a, a unique way, too, because I think a lot of people, like you said, when they're growing up, they have that uh, pull towards, you know, oh, I like the good guys because they're good, and I like the bad guys because they're bad. But of course, as you kind of get out of that uh, phase, you definitely start drawing connections to more and more people outside of that, you know, good bad spectrum i think sure so obviously all of this being a fan of wrestling and you know playing sports it all eventually uh culminated in you becoming a wrestler so when was it that yeah. wrestling really hooked you and you knew that you wanted to be a wrestler well there's actually there's there's two defining moments i i kind of credit and or blame <laughs> For, for that, and uh, the first one is actually, you know, I was um, I was seven years old, and um, I saw Flair, Steamboat, two out of three falls on the Clash from New Orleans, and I specifically remember watching that as a kid, and just, like, my jaw 
being dropped the entire time for that 45 minute match. My jaw was dropped. And, um, after that match, I literally said to myself, okay, I have to do it now. You know what I mean? I have yeah. to be a wrestler now, you know? So that's, that's one. The second one actually came when I was, when I was older. Uh, I was actually, I was, I think I was 16, 17 years old. And it was one of those things where, you know, I'm, you know, it's, it's almost time to start, you know, maybe trying to be a wrestler and things like that. And I was kind of on the cusp of what should I do with my life kind of thing. And um, Undertaker versus Mankind Hell in a Cell. And it wasn't, and those are two completely different matches, you understand, you know, the yeah. Flair Steamboat versus Undertaker Mankind. And it wasn't, like I tell people, it wasn't the fact that I wanted to get thrown off a 20-foot structure like Foley did or anything like that. But for me, it was, um, if I'm going to be a professional wrestler and I'm going to do this, then I'm going to love and I'm going to care about it as much as Nick Foley does. Yeah, absolutely. So, so that was kind of that was kind of a lightning bolt for me. Is this isn't this isn't playtime? You know what I mean? If, if someone's willing to do that for the business, then um, then I uh, then I have to respect that in the sense that I should care no less than he does. And that's definitely that's uh, I de- that's definitely a very uh, powerful standpoint as well because, like you said, you have to care that much because if you don't, I definitely think that you you lose the purpose in a lot of ways of what professional wrestling should be. Yeah. I mean, if, if you're not doing it, if you don't have that kind of love for it, then you never last. I've seen thousands of guys come and go, you know what I mean? Like guys that thought they were going to do this and maybe they did it because their friends were doing it or maybe they did it because it was a goof and they thought it'd be fun or whatever it was. But those guys never last. You know, I mean, I, I, I started when I started, there was, 30 of us from the ages of 15 to 19 that were trying to wrestle. You know what I mean? And here we are 17 years later and there's only two of us left. You understand? So, I mean, and that has, has a lot to do with many things. You know, a lot of people didn't even last the first couple of years. Some people got married and had kids. Some people just because of the style that everyone tries to emulate nowadays, uh, just broke their bodies down. They physically can't do it anymore. But I mean, um, here we are 17 years later and there's only, you know, there's only two of us left. So either way, you know, I just don't think a lot of people have the same passion. I don't think people really have the passion that they should for something they, they claim to love so much. Absolutely. And I definitely, I do see that as well because like you said, you know, you look at the grand scheme of things and wrestlers come and go like the day, like day and night, you know, they come and go, and sometimes they come and go very quickly, and sometimes they come and go, you know, over a long period of time. But eventually, you know, the ones who are truly not passionate will be weeded out. I think. Yeah, and that's and that's something I I stress to like you know I run a, a wrestling school as well, and it's something I stress to my young kids is you know, um, you know, being able to talk, you know, being able to cut a promo, but just being able to talk in general, because, um, wrestling, as long as you can talk, then you're going to have a place in this business. You know what I mean? I could, I could, Lord forbid, I could have an injury tomorrow and not be able to wrestle again, but because I can talk, you know, I'm always going to be able to do something, you know? And I think that promos and, and the thing is with promo, and I don't even necessarily talk about promos in general, just me talking to you right now, you know, it's the same way that I try to uh, convey everything I'm saying as a booker, the, the things that I say to my students in training, you know, all those kind of things that you learn to communicate with, you know, you have to be able to communicate in a um, to get your point across. You know, so it's not necessarily a promo necessarily or, or announcing or anything like that, but just being able to talk and express yourself so everyone's on the same page is a skill in itself. Yeah, absolutely. It certainly is. And like you said, ha- having that skill and honing that skill could mean you being able to last in the business longer than other people because, like you said, you know, God forbid something happened, you know, you can still do something other than wrestle. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's, you know, it's, you talk about it all the time, like, you know, if, what do you do with this guy? You know, if he, if he, if only he can wrestle, you know, then that's all he can do. You understand? It, the more the more arrows you have in your quiver, the the you know the more the better you're going to be. You know. 
Absolutely. That's actually a perfect analogy, I think. So definitely. So speaking of training, obviously, you uh, like you said, you run a school now, and you have that uh, that kind of under your belt as well, that ability to teach, I think. And uh, So looking back, when you were being trained, uh, who was it that trained you, and when was that? Well, we kind of – everything kind of fell into – this is kind of a weird story too. Like <clears throat> we were actually – you know, like I said, the, those 30 guys that were from the 15 ages of, you know, 15 to 19, we were just trying to find our way in the business. And actually, one of our buddy, one of my buddies, he, um, his father is a cop in Newburn, Tennessee, which is only a few minutes away from where we live. And um, at the time, Memphis Championship Wrestling was going strong, and they were a developmental territory for there to be. And um, so there was guys like, you know. William Regal was there, uh, K, K Quick was there, I mean, K, R-Truth was there, you know, but he was K Crush then, um, Reckless Youth, uh, you know, just uh, this host of guys, you know, um, Shooter Schultz, actually Daniel Bryan was there too, I mean, there was just a ton of talent that was in Memphis Championship Wrestling at the time because they were developmental, and um, they used to come to Newburn once a month to hold a show, and they were only drawing like 30, 40 people to the show and my buddy went to terry golden who was the promoter and said you know hey listen my my son and his friend they're they're trying to get into wrestling can you help them out and terry being the the businessman that he was said oh sure send him down to send him down to the um to the arena before the show we'll take a look at him thing and what he did was he he saw what we could do and kind of helped us piece some things out and things like that and then uh, he gave us what he called an intermission match. And the intermission match was actually semi-main event on the card that night. And 200 people showed up to this event because me and my friend that, were, that grew up there our whole lives were wrestling on the event. So we did that for, yeah, I mean, it was, and it was, well, we didn't know what the hell we were doing. We had no concept, we had no concept of, of you know, heel and baby and, and things like that. But we we were mimicking things that we love. We were making mimicking flare steamboat. We were mimicking, you know, things like that. And, uh, we got some really good advice from, um, golden gave us some advice. Obviously William Regal gave us some advice. Um, reckless youth was the coolest guy at that time because Terry didn't actually let us in the locker room with the rest of the guys. He put us out away from everybody in our own separate area. And uh, Reckless came all the way over to our locker room and said hi to us and, like, told us, you know, hey, you know, I'm glad you guys are trying to get in the business. You know, keep it up. You know, don't let anyone discourage you. You know, it gave us a really good pep talk about it. So I always remember that. So Reckless is still to stay one of the, one of, um, one of the guys that I, you know, credit with, you know, being one of the nicest guys that I met at the time. So um, we did that because they were, they were coming once a month. So we did that for a few months. And then uh, WWE pulled the developmental deal from Memphis Championship Wrestling, and then we ended up catching on with a local thing, and then we fin we started finish our training and stuff with them. So it definitely seems like you had a very, uh, very, what would, the, what would the word be? A very unique. <laughs> unique, yeah, unique would be a good word. Uh, very unique training. So definitely that I, I think probably worked in your favor also because I think you had that variety that you had that uh, not only that that uh, application, but you also had that uh, information being uh, billed to you by these people. So I, I definitely think that yeah. probably worked in your favor, definitely. So then, Yeah, it, it wasn't – like I, I don't recommend anybody, you know, breaking in that way necessarily, but, I mean, it is what it is. That's how I broke in. Yeah. And since then, you know, obviously, you know, I – I've done stuff with, you know, Dr. Tom Pritchard and, and Dave Taylor and uh, other people like that. But um, it, it was just a learning process. It's like my mind was just blown because when you first when you first start to get into wrestling, you think you know. Like you think you've got it figured out. And then you quickly realize how little you actually knew. Yeah. You know? And that was made that was made very evident the first day we went. You know, it was, we, we thought we knew, and we just we didn't know Jack. 
so certainly I'm sure it was kind of also like a shelter shock uh, when you were kind of moving up in the moving up in the world of wrestling. You started doing events and stuff. I'm sure it was kind of strange to be like, well, we actually have no clue. Yeah, I mean, we once we started. There, there's always those light bulb moments where people say things or do things, and you start kind of putting it together. And um, but yeah, we had some we had some people that were really were good natured about it and really helped us out. You know, it's all the talent in us. You know, we weren't just some you know some goof kids that you know were trying to disrespect the business by any means. You know, we 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 wanted to be wrestlers. We wanted to be as best we could be. So we asked questions and we were really inquisitive and things like that. And the um, the older guys, you could see that. You know, they weren't gonna not give us information you know they, they they wanted us to succeed too you know like william regal had no had no reason whatsoever to come over and talk to us about our match like there was no nothing he personally could gain from come helping us but he went over there, he, he stood with us for about 10 minutes and told us some of the things we were doing wrong and should be doing and this is why and that's why and stuff like that and he was really really respectful about it absolutely definitely and i think that uh I think that's something that you don't see a whole lot nowadays either is that you don't see that, uh, that, uh, trickle down of information and that, uh, that I don't think you really see that anymore. Really from what I can tell, I think people sometimes just like to think that, well, what I know is what I know and that's all there needs to be kind of mentality. Well, I think it's more of a, I call it the misinformation super highway. (laughs) <laughs> because there's a lot of the blind leading the blind. There's a lot of people that don't know how to wrestle, that don't know how to work, and don't really know what this business is about, but they're the ones teaching people how to wrestle. You understand? Yeah. And that all that does is dilute everything else. You know, um, wrestling is is not about moves. It's not about um, that athletic display. It's great if you're athletic, and it's great, and you should use that to your advantage, but don't rely completely on it. You know, there's, if you rely completely on your athletic ability, um, eventually your athletic ability is going to fade. And what are you going to be left with? You know, everyone gets older, everyone gets injured. So you need to learn how to um, tell a story and, and build characters. And like I said, cut promos and things like that, you know? Yeah, absolutely. I think that's certainly something that, uh, I don't think people understand, and then when when it's time for them to understand, it's kind of like, well, kind of, kind of shot that one in the shot shot that one out the window. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So certainly, uh, kind of ta- kind of moving back a little bit to the whole concept of because uh, you said you that you you really you kind of started trying to break into it. You'd go to this uh, you know the Memphis wrestling and stuff, and you would uh, go to that, those events when they would come to town. So. Uh, what other places did you work as you tried to build your uh, repertoire? What other places did you work at? Well, when we were doing the Memphis stuff, we were only doing the Memphis stuff. But then when when we caught on with the local, and the local company was actually it was NWA Mid South. You know what? And um, we started getting we were that's when we were starting to work every weekend, and we were starting to learn and on a more fast paced kind of basis. You know, when you're working every week, then you're able to learn something new every week and then apply it the next. So it was kind of just this regeneration of, of knowledge going back and forth. And, um, I've always been someone that, you know, that studied the business anyway. So then when I would learn things like that, then I would go back and watch my match, not my matches, but my favorite matches of all time and things like that. Then I was able to watch it with a much better understanding. And I was able to pick out um, things that they were doing and the stories that they were telling and how they were leading me into things and why they did this and why they did that. And it was just, it was like, you know, it's like watching your favorite movie and then someone tells you, hey, did you know that, you know, like in Pulp Fiction, for instance, you know, Pulp Fiction is your favorite movie. Hey, did you know in Pulp Fiction that every clock in Pulp Fiction is, is on 420? You know, and then you go back and you watch it and you realize, oh, hell, it is. Every every clock's on 420, you know. Um, it was one of those deals. Like, I would go back and w- I would watch the the HBK Bret Hart Iron Man match and go, oh, that's why they did that. You know, okay, now I get it. You know, it makes it makes so much more sense now. 
Okay. Uh, I, I think I see where you're coming from. But uh, before we get too far ahead, is it true that all the clocks are the same in Pulp Fiction? Yeah, it is, actually. <laughs> okay, okay. Yeah, so just a little side yeah. note. It's one of my favorite movies, so I was yeah, like, wait yeah. a second, really? <laughs> Yeah, I'm actually well, I'm actually a movie buff too, so I you know I have I have a lot of uh, have a lot of um, useless information when it comes to to movies too. So I, I feel you there. I'm a big movie buff myself, so and no no information about movies is uh, useless. I think <laughs> <laughs> it's all great conversation starters. Right, right, absolutely. So, <laughs> so back to wrestling. No, I'm kidding. Uh, no, uh, <laughs> with. Uh, so, like you said, you work with the, you have, and you do work with the NWA and such. So, like you've had quite a long stand as a fixture in NWA. So, what's it like to be such a key part of an organization with such rich history? Yeah, I mean that's a lot of people. You know, they NWA they may just be three letters to them, but they, they, they it means so much more to me. Like I said, the first. My first memory of life is sitting on my grandmother's knee watching wrestling, and it was the NWA. So the NWA is the reason that I got in the business. And then what, the first, you know, like I said, the NWA Mid South was the first company we really started working for on a regular basis. It was really my what I would call my first home promotion kind of thing. And um, then on top of that, my the first championship I ever won in in wrestling was the NWA Southern Junior Heavyweight Championship. And then I've off and on for the last 17 years, I've been a part of the NWA at some, at some point in time, you know, and now to be, you know, now I'm a three time national heavyweight champion for the NWA. And when you look at that title history and you see Dusty Rose and you see Tully Blanchard and you see Buddy Lindell and Terry Taylor and the mass superstar and Tommy Rich and, uh, uh, Paul Warndorf, you know what I mean? It, and my name is, you know, on that list of guys, it's, it's humbling. You know, to be a part of something like that. Yeah, certainly, certainly is. I mean, like you said, the NWA has some of the most uh, illustrious names to have ever like graced wrestling, and it certainly is. I'm sure it's an honor to be along those names because I think you've definitely earned your own place in an NWA history as well as wrestling history. But certainly, right. certainly, you know, that's. I, I would definitely say that's something to brag about. <laughs> right. But, uh, so definitely with also with NWA and all, with all the promotions right now, uh, you know, being independent wrestling, it, it's just, it's just incredibly popular right now. Independent wrestling is just incredibly explosive and people are, are mm-hmm. loving it. People are loving independent wrestling. So, you know, as someone who's a part of independent wrestling, what do you think is the best and worst part about being in that independent circuit? Um, well, I think what uh, one thing is that it's it's great to be a part of it because <clears throat> never has there been a time in history where people can know you across the world, you know. Like I could just wrestle in Dyersburg, Tennessee, and we could put out a, a weekly show on YouTube, and everyone across the world can know who I am if that show became popular enough. And that's that's something that's a very real possibility, you know, um, which is amazing. You know, before obviously before you that that would have been impossible. You know, you'd have to wrestle every territory, and you know, you'd have to become a national star on a national show and things like that. Um, I think the downfall to it is is that People are looking. People don't understand that wrestling is still a business, you know. And our business is to put an ass every eighteen inches is, is to make money and to be profitable. Yeah. And even though I see a lot of companies out there that have a lot of buzz and they're, you know, they're obviously people are talking about them and people are wanting to see and things like that, but I don't know how many of them are actually making a dollar. I don't know how many of them are actually turning a profit. You know, I see a lot of companies that. They have these amazing stacked cards with 12 matches on them, and there's 30 wrestlers booked on their show. And, yeah, they may have 500 people to 1,000 people at those shows, but are they really making money? Because I'm looking at their card, and as a promoter and as a booker, I know what a lot of those people cost. And when I see, when I see your talent budget, and it's in the twenty to $25,000 range for that, for that one show – 
I don't see how you're making money. Yeah, I would definitely agree with that. Yeah, so, I mean, I think there just needs to be, you know, I don't want to be the, you know, the glass is half empty kind of guy, but, I mean, you know, and the thing is, if the company makes money, then the company keeps going. If the company keeps going, more guys get to work, and then the guys make money. But when things happen like that, then companies, they burn themselves out, they hot shot themselves, and then they're not in business in two years, you know? Certainly. And, and, I, and I don't necessarily think that's a – I would disagree with the statement that that would be a glass half empty. I think that's more of a – the glass is at 50% capacity. It's more realistic, I think, because I think there's there's optimism and then pessimism, but then there's realism. Yeah. So I think that's just a realistic yeah. approach to it because you're right. I mean, how can you keep your business alive if you're booking five people who are going to cost you $5,000 a piece just to come on a show and, you know, put on 30 minutes of work and then, hey, you know – it's just whatever after that. So I would definitely agree with that. Yeah. I mean, the the business used to be, you know, the promoters made money. Promoters, you know, the, the richest people in the territory weren't, wasn't the top star. It was the promoter. You know, it was Jerry Jerry. It was um, Bob Geigel. It was, you know, Vern Gagne. It was, um, you know, uh, Eddie Graham. You know, those were those were the guys that made the most money. But now it's almost reversed in wrestling. Now the promoter makes no money, but like the wrestlers are the ones that are get, they're getting paid. You know, yeah. the guys that have these buzz, the guys that have these this buzz and they get and they get booked and that's great for them. I'm glad they're able to make a living at it. But you know, I think they're I think they're just um, reaping reaping the rewards. I guess you know because if that guy goes out of business, they don't care. They'll just take another book. Yeah. Oh, can you can you still hear me, Greg? Yeah, I can hear you. Now. Okay, sorry, sorry. Yeah, there was a little, little bit of a skip there, but we're good. But yeah, yeah, definitely, you're right. It's like as soon as you know you go to this guy, he goes to a show, and it's like you know he has five thousand dollars for an appearance. It's like he'll still make make money because someone will still always pay him that money. But, yeah. no, you know, there's not always going to be those businesses there to do that because eventually, you know, without being smart, they will go out of business. So certainly that's – Yeah, it. I mean, I mean, listen, and like I'm saying, there's lots of guys that are worth their money, and I'm not saying that they're not. Uh, but, you know, it has to be – it has to work both ways, you know. Um, you have to find out who's dollar for dollar the best, best guys to book. You know, we found out over the years that, you know, Hacksaw Jim Duggan. Is still dollar for dollar <laughs> one of the best guys you can ever bring in because he's people recognize him, they know exactly who he is, and they're going to pay to see him. And he's not he's not outrageously expensive. He's fair, you know, and he'll he'll make you money, and you'll leave with money in your pocket, and that's great. You know, Buff Bagwell is another guy that you know dollar for dollar is a great talent to have because he's going to make money. Certainly. Yeah, and that's also an interesting perspective that, you know, someone who like yourself who has done the booking can give because, you know, any, not every, anybody can give the perspective of, hey, these are the good people to book because, like you said, they're worth the money that they ask for, but not everybody can give that perspective, I think. Right. I mean, like I say, I'm not saying that anyone, you know, I, I, anybody that can make it. You know, living in this business, that's great. But it, it has to work both ways, I think. If I think if, you know, Joe Blow that was on, you know, Ring of Honor and, and people like him and things like that, and, he, and he's asking $1,500 in a flight to come in, and, you know, he's not going to draw you, you know, $1,500 in a flight worth of people, you know, then it just doesn't compute to me, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So certainly, uh, like you said, like there's, I mean, first of all, there's millions and millions of good and bad things about independent wrestling. And I think what you mentioned are actually very interesting and very deep seated things that I think will eventually either be the downfall of independent wrestling or the good thing about independent wrestling. (laughs) I definitely think it can go both ways. But, uh, something also along the same lines with, you know, independent wrestling being so popular right now, you know, since it has become even more popular in recent years, and that 
that is that popularity is going to keep increasing. It's going to skyrocket even more. There's also been a division of opinions on approaches and styles of wrestling. You know, certain people will say, hey, this is good, this is not. But there was also a recent right. Twitter exchange involving Rip Rogers and Randy Orton. And it seems to highlight the divide of those who stand on the modern style and those who stand on the more traditional side. Uh, what would be your take and how do you view the approach wrestling? Uh, how do you view your own approach in your own matches? Well, I, I'm definitely a traditionalist. You know, I, my, my concept is to tell a story, um, to take less is more kind of, of route, you know, and that um, at the end of the day, if you don't sell, then they're not going to buy. You understand? Yeah. Um, and I, and I think I, you know, I, I follow Rip on Twitter like a lot of people, and he, he's dead on in my opinion and everything he always says. <laughs> you know, I mean, he just, um, and it, I think the young guys. I don't know if this is a culture thing nowadays and just society in general, but. Th- they don't like to be told that they're wrong. You know what I mean? It's like, and the thing is too, is <clears throat> I, I've had arguments before too, where, you know, a guy will kick the living shit out of somebody, you know, they'll, you know, they'll, they'll do the snap mare thing and they'll kick the living shit out of someone in the back. Right. And, you know, in wrestling, you have to take care of each other. There's no way that you can kick each other like that seven days a week and, and last in this business. And that's what we're seeing. Guys that are doing this kind of thing, they are doing it for the short term because they're not going to be around in 20, 30 years to still draw money and still make a living at this business. Um, but the, the, hypocr- the hypocrisy of it comes when you sit down and you tell them, hey, listen, you know, you shouldn't do this, and, you know, this is why, and stuff like that. Well, and then they say, well, you know, it's a phony business that doesn't matter. Well, that's contradictory to why you're kicking the shit out of somebody. <laughs> exactly. You know, you're kicking, you're kicking the shit out of somebody because you want them to believe it's real. But then when we tell you that, you know, this is how you tell a story, and this is how you build matches, and this is psychology, and this is the why's, how's, and the, and the, and the what, and then you're going to sit here and tell me it's phony. Yeah, you know, that's the hypocrisy of it. Like I actually told someone one time because they they started in on that, and I said, "Well, I'll tell you what. I, from now on, you know, my character is that I'm an alien from another planet, and uh, I'm invincible. And every time I touch you, you bump, and I pin you. And then the well, way you can't do that, I was like, "Why not? You're saying wrestling's phony. Yeah, exactly. Why? Why can't I do that? Why can't I do that? If that if that's what you if that's what you're gonna say." Then why can't I do that? See, the thing is, wrestling, in my eyes, and I believe, you know, Rip would agree with me on this, is that, you know, wrestling has to be viewed in the eyes of reality. You know, and, um, you know, I just came back from Vegas. You know, I go to Vegas every year for the CAC and things like that. And we went and saw um, Penn and Teller uh, while we were out there. And Penn said something that really hit home for me. Because he was talking about magic, but it applies to wrestling, too. He said, you know, when people go to a movie or they go to a play or whatever it is, they walk in there and they check their suspension of disbelief at the door. You know, they know that they're going to see a movie. They know that they're going to see a play, and they're willing to to give themselves up to to that to that world. But when people go see a magic show, and this goes the same thing for wrestling, people go to see a wrestling show, they walk in there with a chip on their shoulder. They want to try to figure out what the hell's going on. You know, they want to know, is it a trap door? You know, is her legs in that other box? You know, that kind of thing. And same thing with wrestling. Did he really hit that clothesline? What's that? It's our job to protect the magic as much as we can. So as long as wrestling, as long as wrestling is a spectator sport, you know, where people are buying a ticket for them to come in and you perform live in front of them like that, then you have to try to protect the reality of it. I think that's, I think that's a perfect way to say it. Actually, I think that's a wonderful way to say it because I think you're right. 
I think that if you are not doing that and you are just going out there and doing exactly what they are thinking, saying that, hey, it's phony, it doesn't matter, if you go out there and you treat it as such, what's going to happen is you're going to see wrestling end up like any anything else. You know, it's going to end up being a... a a dead language is going to be a dead sport, and people are not going to want to watch it because you're not trying anymore. And you know, and the, and they use things like, <clears throat> you know, you know, the dick test of strength or the dick hip toss or whatever it was, or you know, they 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 use all that kind of stuff as examples of why you know well, it's got this many hits on YouTube and things like that, and those kind of things. It, those are the kind of things that non-wrestling fans watch and then share to show everyone else how phony wrestling is. Yeah. You understand? And that's why I don't think that this, that's a true, you know, measuring stick of of what's popular and why we should go that direction. You know, like I said this a couple years ago, I said, you know, we're you know, we're a couple steps away from wrestling having a laugh track on it. <laughs> you know? And if you watch and if you watch WWE for instance, you know, they, they do scores and they do different camera angles and stuff like that, like the House of Fours match, which to me kills suspension of disbelief. Um, it's just, it's hard. It's hard to go. There's very few guys left that actually worked a legitimate territory. You know what I mean? The, you know, the Tracy Smothers and the Jerry Lynn's and, and the guys like that that actually worked a territory where however the money that you made was dependent completely on how many people were in those seats, you know, yeah. and what your spot on the card was. Um, and I think that's that's the thing, guys. Guys think they should get guaranteed this much of money. They should come and be able to do whatever they want and then go do it again. You know, if if they believe that um, they should be able to do whatever they want and that they shouldn't have to try to tell stories and things like that, then, you know, to me, they shouldn't be wrestling necessarily. They should quit charging admission to their shows. They should just hire a bunch of extras to sit in their crowd, and then they can do whatever they want to do and tell them how to react to it and then shoot it like a movie or a television show or however they want to do it and then release that. Because as long as you, as they're paying you, and you have to try to make them react, you have to make them cheer or boo or cry or whatever emotion you're trying to evoke for them, then they're your customer. Yeah. Definitely, definitely. So definitely, I think with uh, the entire argument, the the like the traditional style versus the new style. Uh, so do you see one side as right or wrong, or is there a middle ground that has to be had for good wrestling and good growth? Yeah, I mean, like, okay, like, because of the way, like, you've heard me talk about this for the last, you know, 45 minutes or so, but I mean, I get a reputation that I'm completely 100% against, that I love old school so much that I hate everything else that's out there in wrestling now, and that is not true at all. You know, I love all styles of wrestling. I love Japan. I love Lucha. I love, you know, World of Sport, English. I love all that kind of stuff. My problem is with, you know, is selling. You know, no one's selling anything they do. A move only means as much as you let it mean. You understand? Yeah. Like, I've, I've, won, I've lost matches with a single punch, but we built up to the fact that I was going to get punched. You understand? And when I took that one punch... It meant something, and the people reacted accordingly. You know, like um, Tyler Bates and and Pete Dunn had an amazing match at NXT. You know, I mean, it was a great match. You know, for any for any era, you understand. Great matches are are matches that you could plot them in any era of wrestling, and they would still be a great match. You know, I I watched. Jack Briscoe, Dory Funk go just about an hour in Japan. And that match is like art. And you could take that match and you could re recreate it today and it would still be a great match. Certainly. And that's and that's what it is. So I don't I'm I'm obviously more on the side of the tr traditionalist, but I want the business to to grow and, and things like that too. So 
You know, when someone does something that's amazing, you know, that's that's completely amazing, then, of course, I, I want to see more of that, too. But I just want it to mean something when they do it. Yeah, absolutely. And I, and I think that I kind of uh, side with exactly, almost exactly where you are, because I do think that uh, nowadays you see a lot of people who, uh, they get in the ring, and like you said, there's no selling. They don't try to tell a story. They just get in there, they do a bunch of fancy moves, and they just hop around, and that's it. And, of course, I'm not going to talk down to anybody who does that kind of stuff. But the point of it is that when I watch wrestling, I, I'm trying to watch it not just for the athleticism. I'm watching it because I'm. it's like storytelling. You have to have good setting. You have to have a good theme. You have to have good characters. It can't just be all action all the time. It has to have a buildup. Has to have a climax. So definitely, I think that wrestling can always improve. And I think that if you mesh both sides together, you can create a good, solid wrestling that other than people, other than wrestling fans, would even enjoy. But of course, you know, people people don't like to admit. Oh, you know. My style of wrestling isn't the only style of wrestling, but of course, you know that's that's why that's where I think like uh, people like you, for instance, you're pretty versatile in the ring. So it's like you understand all sides of that. Yeah, I mean, I, I've used every aspect. You know, like well, like we talked about the Japanese, the English, the the lucha style, you know, Southern style, you know, whatever you want to talk about. I've used it all at various points in different situations, but it has to make sense. You know, I, and I, I stress this a lot, too, is that no one today really knows how to be a good guy, and no one really knows how to be a bad guy, you know, and that's something that's been lost in translation for so many years. The greatest stories ever told have an antagonist and a protagonist. It's just the way it is, you know, so you have to have someone to love and someone to hate, and you can only love that somebody if you hate this other guy, you know, that's and that's what's happening. The bad guys, The bad guys are going out there. And, you know, they're being cool and cocky, and they're doing all the cool moves, and then they wonder why no one likes their good guys as much. And it's like, well, maybe they sh- you should actually put them against someone that's actually a heel. Yeah. Definitely. And I, and I think that's another thing, too, with wrestling nowadays, is that uh, sometimes it's hard telling who's the heel or who's the good guy, unless you're specifically told. I mean, uh, especially even with mainstream wrestling, you know, with the whole WWE, something that I've always not necessarily despised, and this might just be my weighted opinion, is that I've never been a fan of Roman Reigns. And I think it's because I want him to be a heel, but I know he's not. And I feel like that definitely tarnishes that, that what I want in wrestling, if that makes sense. Yeah, I mean, and like I've said this for years too, like Roman would be the biggest baby face in the company, no doubt about it, if he was working with people that were actually heels. Yeah. You know, heels have to have an unredeemable quality. You understand? They have to have a quality that no self-respecting person would cheer them. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, exactly. And, like, I, I use this as an example. When I was, you know, I was booking a show in Arkansas, and I was, I was the heel. I was the top heel in the company. Uh, things got a little stale for a little bit, so I decided that um, I would go on a losing streak. And uh, I had a heel manager at the time who was the, you know, the owner of the company. And I went on this losing streak, and he would start berating me every time I lost. And the people were wanting me to turn, right? Because um, they, they felt like they'd seen enough wrestling that, that that's where it was going, so they thought I was going to turn. right? But then I would never give them a reason to cheer me. I would He would start berating me, and when it looked like I was fixing a bow up on him or do something like that, I would like drop to my knees and beg him to keep me. You know what I mean? Exactly, yeah. Or, or like he would start berating me and tell me he's going to get rid of my sorry ass or whatever he's going to do, and then I would like, I would give him one of those forcible hugs where I'm like, please love me, you know? <laughs> yeah. You know, and then w- what happened was we did that for six or eight weeks, and then I got, you know, I snapped back on track, you know, and I was the, I was the, I was the winning heel again, you know? But I never, and it gave me kind of like a fresh start. 
but we needed that little re-jump to do it. But I never gave that – see, I never gave them a reason to really like me. They just hated him too. You know, so if I would have done the switch or I had done something to make them like me and then switch back, it would have just been wishy-washy, and they wouldn't have believed it. But since we did it where, you know, he was heel and I was just, you know, heel too, and I they never had a reason to like me anyway, when I got back on track, they hated me even more. Exactly. You know? Yeah. Not only was I a cheater and a liar, but then I was, you know, I was also spineless and I was a coward and I was a groveler and things like that. Exactly, but you, like you said, you built a story around that entire that aspect of your uh, heel character, and it made you even more solidified afterwards. Exactly. So certainly, I think like overall there's a lot of improvement that wrestling can have. And I think there's a lot of that, uh, even pri- like, you know, the prime time wrestling TV shows and such. I think there's a lot that they can learn from the independent wrestling and they can learn from people else, but you know, in, in, in a perfect world, right? <laughs> in a perfect world. Yeah. I mean, there's just a lot of, like I said, there's just a lot of, of, of misinformation out there. There's a lot of blind leading the blind. A lot of people just don't know these things because they've never been in situations where they had to know them. They were never in companies where they they had to rely on those kind of things. You know, I've spent, you know, not just the training with with Dr. Tom and, and Dave Taylor and all the other guys and stuff like that, but, like, you know, me spending time talking to Jim Cornette or me spending time, you know, me spending a couple hours in a car with J.J. Dillon taking him to the airport and me picking his brain about booking. I mean, all this kind of stuff, is you know a culmination of that kind of thing you have to tell a story you have to be you have to be um you you can't be everybody wants to be cool like i said everybody wants to be the cool heel and things like that but you can't always you can't be that i mean that your job is to be hated exactly. you know so if you're not if you're not hated then you're not doing your job Certainly, and I think that uh, people, I think people, what's the word I'm trying to look for? I think definitely in wrestling now, you know, I think we have, you know, you have your good guys, then you have your bad guys, but then you have your watered down bad guys that are like, you know, diet, diet heels, essentially, you know, like they, they're heels, but they want to be liked. So they're like, I'm kind of, kind of a heel, you know what I mean? I'm sugar free, you know? <laughs> Yeah, I'm I'm a heel, but I want you to retweet all my shit on Twitter. And I'm a heel, but you know, I'm a heel, but hey, I want to do, you know, if I'm wrestling a baby face that can barely do an arm drag, then I'm still going to do my moonsault and my fucking 450 and all the shit I do, and then expect people to still boo me, you know, which doesn't happen. Exactly. You know. But you know, like like I said, there, there's a lot of improvement, and in a perfect world, it might happen. But sometimes you just gotta accept how it is, and you know. But it's, it is hard, though. It is hard to like look at wrestling as a whole and just be like, you know, it's perfect. But obviously, that that, that will never happen. Yeah. <laughs> the the thing is, you know, like we said, like guys are not only they're all working the same; they're all working atypically the same type of match. You know, wrestling used to be different because the cowboy character didn't work anything like the Indian character, you know, and then the foreign heel character didn't work anything like, you know, you know, um, this other guy. It was all about the meshing of styles. You know, it's kind of like UFC. When UFC first started, you know, it was it was fighter. You know, it was it's the bar fighter versus the guy that knows Taekwondo who would win, you know. And that was what the appeal of it was. And then UFC, now it's, now it's the UFC style. You know, everyone can strike. Everyone has a ground game. Everyone does this. <laughs> you know, things like that. And then wrestling became the same way. You know, you know when you watch a, a match on television that the main event, you know, the first match on the card is going to have three false finishes. The second match is going to have six. The third match is going to have eight and a half. <laughs> you know, by the time we get to the main event, there's 15 false finishes. You know, they just keep up in the end. You know, you watch television, you watch, just watch WWE. Watch WWE from, like, 94, you know, and you'll see a good guy go out there, and he'll make his comeback, and he'll beat the guy with his comeback. You know, heaven forbid, you know, he actually makes a straight comeback and beats the guy. Exactly. You know, we do a lot of that here. 
we do a lot of that here. We do straight comeback finishes on a lot of things because that's what wrestling is. We want people, that's what movies are. You know, movies is, you know, the the baby face goes through the, the dilemma and gets his ass kicked and then he makes the big comeback at the end and he wins. You know, so we do a lot of straight comeback finishes and things like that. So and I think you I, have to yeah. go ahead. Oh no, go I was ahead. Like, go, go ahead. You can continue, continue your thought there. I was gonna say that, you know, you just have to um those those different characters produce different styles and they all work differently. Ergo the matches were never the same. You know what I mean? You can go watch WrestleMania three right now and you're gonna see, you know, all the guys on those cards and none of those two matches are gonna be the same, you know? Oh yeah. And and it's like along the same lines that's like you know, you can watch a match from, you know, 10, 15 years ago, and it's like, oh, you know, uh, Jerry Jerry Lawler pile drives this guy and then pins him, and that's the end of the match. Now it's like Adrian Neville's going to do six 450 splashes, and the guy's going to kick out on the seventh one. You know what I mean? Well, it's like Roman, like we said with Roman Reigns, unfortunately, it's like Roman's finish is not a spear. It's, it's three Superman punches and two spears. <laughs> you know what I mean? You know, meanwhile, you know, I've like I use a finishing move called the Midas touch. You know, it's like it's like a stone cold stunner, except I, I use the arm in there somewhere. And uh, in the year and a half that, you know, I've been, you know, babyface in Dyersburg, only one person has kicked out of that in a year and a half. You know, so when I hit that move, everyone knows that's the end, you know, and they react to that accordingly. And that one time that guy kicked out of it, they lost their shit. Exactly. You know, and that's what you have to do. Those moves only mean as much as you make them mean. You know, I remember, um, like, when Triple H went to went to pedigree Batista, and, like, he couldn't do it. Remember that? He was so strong that, like, he, he, he raised up like he was going to do it and got caught. Like, I can't fucking do it. Yeah. You know, that, that was a moment. Exactly. You know, that's something that's stuck in my mind because he'd never done that with anyone else before no one really even reversed it much you know they didn't really backdrop him out of it very much you know it was like you know if he does the pedigree that's it exactly but it, but it meant know, something because you know he it was like one of the first time he did, did you know had done that but then like you look forward into matches you know more recently uh like i believe there was the seth rollins and triple h match where I don't even know how many pedigrees there were or how many times they, you know, I mean, it was just one of those things where it's like false finish after false finish after false finish starts making these finishing moves mean nothing. Yeah, wrestling wrestling used to be a business where any move could beat you at any time. Yeah. Now it's a move that no move can beat you at any time. And it's like they're trying to accomplish the same thing with those they're trying to create false finish moments by doing that, but they're creating it from two different ends of the spectrum. You know, me, I would rush, much rather be in the in a world where, you know, I can get a, I can take a belly to back suplex, and get beat, rather than having to take three brain busters. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like I've, I've, I don't think I've ever taken a brain buster to be honest. I mean, I just. I don't want to take it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, there, there. I think there are certain moves that's okay to say with. Uh, I mean, I think there's a reason a lot of people don't use that move anymore. <laughs> well, the thing is, and they changed that too. You know, the Brain Buster, it used to, when Dick Murdoch and Coco Ware and guys like that used it, it was one of the safest things you could do. You, he, they'd pick him up for the suplex, and then they would like, they would drop to their ass. And then the guy would hit the mat, and it would still look like he got brain busted. It still looked like a believable move, you know. But the guy was legitimately safe. Exactly. Now guys are dropping each other on a, on a, they're dropping each other on their heads, and you know that's why guys' careers are not Dick Murdoch twenty twenty five years in the business anymore. It's you know fifteen years, and then he has a software job somewhere because he can't wrestle anymore. Exactly. And that's kind of the unfortunate reality of it because, you know, people people want that flare and that flash, but they don't want that safety. That's going to eventually save them. And when they don't use that safety, 
it's just going to backfire. And it, like you said, their careers are going to be abrupt. <laughs> right, exactly. So certainly, you know, we've been talking a lot about that. So kind of to write, you know, round this up a little bit and wrap it all up, uh, we got a couple fun questions for you here. So first of all, thing that most fans don't know about Greg Anthony. Uh, that's a good question. <laughs> it was a very good question. Let me, let me think for a second here. Let's see. Um, well, I already said that I was a movie buff, didn't I? You did. Um, I'll tell you what. The Golden Boy Greg Anthony actually won a womanless beauty review. About 15 years ago. Okay. Um, <laughs> it was a, it was a, it was a benefit, a benefit thing for, uh, for an organization here in Dyersburg. And, um, I won it because, uh, <laughs> the MC of the event asked me, you know, it was like a pageant situation, you know, so he, you know, he brought me up and here I am in heels and, you know, a wig and makeup and the whole nine yards. And, um, he asked me, you know, you know, how was your first day as a woman? And uh, I said, well, you know, like every great woman, let me answer a question with a question. How would you feel to be my gynecologist? <laughs> and the whole place erupted. And so I ended up winning the woman of the that, that That's fantastic. That is probably one of the most incredible things ever right there. <laughs> <laughs> Oh my! So that that's that's hard to that's hard to come that's hard to like follow up on. That's incredible. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so so the other thing would be is uh, what 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 are your goals for twenty seventeen? <laughs> um, you know the the goal is always to be a world champion. You know the goal is to be, to have the ten pounds of gold. In my opinion, um, so that's that's always on the horizon. I think you know that's always kind of guiding me some way shape form or fashion other way is just to just you know to to broaden nwa mid south as much as i can we run every friday night and every saturday night here in, in tennessee we run every friday night in ripley and every saturday night in dyersburg and um just to maybe do more shows we're going to do probably 110 shows um by the end of 2017 you know i'd uh, like to add more you know so the more times we can wrestle the better Absolutely, absolutely. All right. So this one's kind of a uh, something that we just found out. Something that's kind of thrown in here. So what are your t- what's your opinion and take on Billy Corgan purchasing the NWA? Uh, only time will tell, really. Um, okay. I I really don't know, Billy. I've met Billy. Um, a couple of years ago in Vegas for the Coffer Alley stuff, and um, I talked to him a little bit then. Um, you know, I'm just to me the NWA is. Um, it, you, know, I've told you how near and dear the NWA is to my heart. So I mean, as far as as far as it goes, I just hope it it gets bigger and better, no matter who's who's at the helm. So um, you know, they've reached out uh, to all the. Uh, the affiliates and things like that. So, you know, we'll, we'll see how things go. I, I don't have a crystal ball, unfortunately. Yeah. Sometimes, sometimes I wish I did, but I'd probably use it to find out the Powerball number. Not <laughs> what's going on. With it. That's, I think that's a fair thing to do. I think it's fair. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Right, so then where can people follow you on social media so they can keep up with the awesomeness that is Greg Anthony? That's a good way to put it. Yeah. Um, on Twitter, I'm at NWA Golden Boy. And then on Facebook, it's the Golden Boy Greg Anthony. Those are the best ways. And then uh, please go like uh, uh, on Facebook, go like NWA Mid South, you know, and that's the best ways to, to keep up with me right there. And, um, you know, I I post things, you know, I, I've always felt like I was kind of, um, I'm kind of a witty guy. You know, like I said, I like to, I like to joke around and, uh, Things like that. So, like my Facebook, I, I, I talk about funny things that are going on in, in, in general. So, I mean, uh, if you follow me on there, you know, I, I like uh, as many likes and comments as I can. So, All right. So, you heard it here, guys. If you want to follow the Golden Boy, 
you know where to find him. You know where to hear his jokes, to see anything that he is going to post. And like he said, go follow his promotion or the promotion he works for, and make sure you support them and all, all together support independent wrestling. But thank you so much for uh, coming on here, Greg, and uh, having us or let us pick your brand and talk to you a little bit. Absolutely, absolutely. Anytime, guys. Well, awesome. So, and of course, maybe down the road we can catch back up with you, see how everything's going, to, you know, with Billy Corgan and the NBA. <laughs> Hopefully it's going yeah, absolutely. well. But uh, yeah, yeah. thank you so much, Greg, for coming on here, you know, talking with me for an hour. It's been wonderful. It's been a legitimate honor and pleasure. Yeah, man. I appreciate it. Thank you. Come crack open a cold one and let Old Mancer tell you a story. King of big dog style. Laird's a lot beer. The king of the trailer court. Your favorite wrestler of mine, me. This is Warner's Wisdom with Mance Warner. All right, people, here we go. Red lights on. That mean we live. That mean old mess right here talking, dropping big old bombs of knowledge out here. Wisdom for all you people out there. <coughs> Little mess of clear stuff right here. Is your favorite wrestler and mine, me, old messer, right here. Coming at you, another edition of Warner's Wisdom right here. It's on, what is it, Sunday? It's Sunday right here, old master. It's on a Sunday. Another edition of the Warner Wisdom on the Dave Dynasty Show. This is the best part of the Dave Dynasty Show. Old master, your favorite wrestler of mine, me, King of Big Dog Style, check. Larry to Lot Beer, check. Master of the pop-up headbutt, check. See, I, see what I'm doing right here? I'm going through all my nicknames. And it's saying check. And then I should be getting a whole bunch of checks because old master go out there and he just puts a show on, baby. Now, before I trail off on to what else old master wants to talk about. See, today's going to be different. I ain't got one topic. I'm just going to sit out here and ramble on and ramble on because that's what old master wants to do. It's nice outside. I've been outside all day. I got home at, I think it was around... 9 or 10 in the morning. Yesterday, Old Master was out there for Proving, proving Ground Pro Wrestling out there in Illinois. Old Master was out there putting the boots to people. Right now, see, this is a podcast, but if this was a video cast, a video drone, I could point the camera down and show that I'm still wearing my boots, baby, because they're the most beautiful boots Old Master ever had. Old Master wears them when he gets in the ring, puts the boots to people, goes out there, Putting them down. It's a beautiful boots. I wear them all day long. You never know an old master got to go out there and just put a whooping on something. Got my knee pads on too. Because you know at some point old master going to look at somebody, drop them down. He going to look up to the Lord and have a little conversation real quick and I'm going to go, knee pad up, knee pad down. It's the best thing going today, people. Old master gonna come right and hit a big old knee right to somebody's dome out there. That's just the way it's gonna go. Now, like I said, old master, his wisdom for y'all today is it's beautiful outside. Get off the damn computers. Get off the damn TVs. Unless you're watching old master or watching or listening to an old master podcast here on the Dave Dynasty show. Other than that, though. Old Master is saying, you people need to go outside. It's beautiful outside. This goes off what I was saying last week, all the things you can do that also involve light beer. Old Master had a couple light beers a day. Old Master going to roll back out there, finish up mowing up this yard. I'm going to drink some more light beers. Probably going to cook some burgers out there. It's a beautiful day. Like I said, the only wisdom Old Master going to give you today, this is more Old Master just checking in. The wisdom is, it's beautiful outside. You people need to be out there doing something, having a good time. Correct? Correct. I know. Old Master's right, baby. You know it and I know it. We all know it. It's true. Now, on top of the wisdom of, don't be a dummy and go outside and have a good time. Enjoy them light beers. Go chasing down some of the honeys. Old Master, like I said, was in Illinois. I'm going to keep this short because I don't want to go too long into what I saw out there. Old Master, Proven Ground Pro, did a show down there, Illinois. Had my beautiful t-shirts, Laird's and Light Beer, that you can buy on ProWrestlingTees.com. You go on there, put in Manser, put in, let me get this correct, y'all put in Mance Warner. 
Same person, old master, right here looking at you. Well, I ain't looking at you. I'm talking to you. Go to Pro Wrestling Tees, buy old master t-shirt. You'll look cool. Not as cool as old master, but still, you'll be cool. On top of that, master got some new t-shirts out. But that's only at, only at the live events. You got to go out there and actually come see master and you can buy one of them t-shirts. Now, on to this trip. On this trip here, when Old Master is going to Illinois, got in my beautiful truck. Old Master hit the road, drove and drove and drove. Went to Scenic Rat. Went to, instead of staying on the old in, interstate. Old Master like he likes to roll through the the Scenic Rat. I like to see what's out there. You see some deers running around. See some raccoons. See some big old ugly country ladies. But that's cool, man. We're living the life out here. We are chasing dreams, people. Old Master is right here with you. Now, during this journey, the journey up there, fine. No, no situations, nothing, nothing bad at all. Old Master got to the venue, beautiful venue. It was in, it looked like a 1920s movie theater. The ring was up on the stage. Big old, big old nice venue. Beautiful. I didn't take no pictures, old master. Didn't, but I'm sure they're on the internet somewhere. You can see how nice this venue was. Now, as I proceed with this story here, Manser gets the W. Manser hits the pay window. Manser puts the boost to people. Manser got some light beers. You know I'm, you know I'm going to people. Bring them out there for old master. I get them. I drink them up. Had a good time. Sell some t-shirts. Sell them 8 by 10s I cut your deals on them, too. Old Master always out here willing to deal them, baby. That's just the way it is. Now, on to what Old Master saw on the way back. Now, it's late at night. Like you said, Old Master, like Old Master is saying, I like to take them country routes. Ain't no one really out there late at night. Now, see, Master hit up old little gas station. I've went to that before, too. Best place to take a shit. Real nice gas stations out there. Now, why old master was out there, I stopped, got me a, a energy drink. I'm a cheapskate. I get them rippets. You know me. I like to go in Dollar General, too. My favorite store in the world, old DG. I put them over all the time because they always got deals. And they always suck an old master up. That's where old master just came from. Make some purchases. I'm going to get back to this yard. I'm going to get back to these light beers. I'm going to get back to putting the boots of people out here. Now, back, back to my story here. My little bit of wisdom here. On the way back, it was the damnedest thing. Old master's rolling back. Hit the old gas station up. Got my dollar energy drink, my rippy. And as I'm driving back, old master saw something in the sky. I swear to you, I ain't lying to you. Now, you go back in the archives, you've seen the old master. Old master has already tangled, has already danced with the, with the alien species before. Old master's already been with him, already put the boots to him, already hit him with the headbutts, already hit him with the pop-up headbutt, already hit him with the dramatic paws. Now I'm looking up because y'all can't see me. I'm looking to the heavens. I just made a cross in the air. do? Old Master's already danced with, with these demons in the sky. Now, I saw a UFO. Shouldn't be a surprise. Like I said, you've already, you already know. You've been listening to Old Master. You've seen and heard of my stories before. Now, this is alarming, though. This is alarming for Old Master and for you people, too. I battled with them before. I ain't never seen them since. That means they're back. They always been up there. Old Master kidnapped by them before. Fought my way off the UFO, off the spacecraft with my buddy, my Asian buddy, who was blind and deaf. Me and him together formed a great tag team and we fought our way off that spacecraft, right? Now, this is the issue. I seen one. 
Been a long time since old master seen one. That means right there. It means two things. It means they're back. That means they're possibly coming for you and they're most likely coming for Manser. Old Manser. Now, here's, here's the reason. When I tangled with these beans before, Old Manser caused a massacre up there on the spacecraft. A massacre that my words can't even put into a picture of how, how it really was. There's blood everywhere, alien blood, all over the spacecraft. Smashed in alien skulls, big tall creatures dead all over the place. When Messer did that, I put fear in their hearts. If they got hearts, I don't know. I didn't, I didn't cut one open and take a gander at what was inside that beast. Here's the thing. When Messer fought his way off there with my, my buddy, my little Asian buddy, I put the fear inside them beans. Now, I saved us all. When old Messer put the boots to him with my buddy and we massacred him up there on their spacecraft and then pulled it together and we landed the spacecraft and got out of there, that means other alien beings came and discovered that spacecraft. I'm not saying it's right what I did in there. I'm saying I had to do what I had to do. It was either me or them. But the other beings came, and I'm telling you, I probably killed some alien daddies. And then their kids came and saw it. Their wife got had to get on the spacecraft and identify the alien bodies. Those wives then went home and had to tell the alien babies that the daddy got killed. Right? And those babies grew up. You're smarter than us, I'm telling you that much. I might have sold an 8 by 10 to an alien in disguise, and then he took it back to the planet, and there's all these alien babies growing up, right? Watching Old Master, looking at these 8 by 10s Old Master's had a, a, about a million 8 by 10s to this day. I don't know which one they got. But old master don't really age. I've been this pretty since 1977. So those alien babies, they done grew up waiting for their time to come strike. Come try to take old master down. The young bucks, I'm talking about the aliens, not the tag team. These young bucks out here, they grew up. Now they want to they take a shot. They've been practicing for, for years and years out there. They've been doing push-ups and, and alien baby Hindu squats. They've been out there with their weapons, their ray guns. They've been training their whole life to take a, take a swing at old master. And as I said, on the way back from Illinois, out in the country out there, old master saw one. That means it's just a matter of time. So everybody out there needs to start getting ready. They need to start getting ready and they need to start training, taking their vitamins, whatever that may be, mine's light beers. Old Master's getting ready. You should get ready too. I told you before, they'd probably be coming back at some point. I done seen one. That means they got their eyes on Messer. I'm the prize, man. They got their eyes on the prize. So my advice to you people out there, start training. Be ready. Maybe go rent Predator Part 1. Part two, don't worry about the other ones. This is part one and part two. Get you ready for what you need to know. Rent Aliens. Old Master saw the new Alien movie too. I'll give a review on that probably next week or coming weeks. You need to start looking up some alien business out there. Get on some podcasts out there. Search Aliens. Old Master, I've seen them. i fought them before, man. Doesn't mean they're coming back though. You got to get ready right now. Old master telling you, I seen them. They're coming for me. Then that mean they're going to be coming for you. Okay. 
I can't dwell on it too long. Either they come or they don't. They are. I've told you that much. I'm going to get back to my light beer drinking, putting the boots to people. That's all we can do, people, is wait. That's all we can do at this point is sit out here and wait. That's just the way it's going to be. Old man's going to get off here and go do what you got to do. You people be safe. I'm telling you, listen to me. This is the wisdom I'm giving you. At first, the wisdom was just going to be go outside. Now, maybe you're right. Maybe you should stay inside. Stay inside and watch a whole bunch of these podcasts. Listen to the podcast. Until next time, it's been another edition of Warner's Wisdom here on the Dave Dice Show with your favorite wrestler of mine, me, old master, Laird's and Light Beer, the Southern Psycho, King of Big Dog Style, the master of the pop up head, but oh, wackadoo. Wackadoo, wackadoo, man. That's all I can say at this point. This is serious now, people. All right, I'm going to get off here and enjoy these light beers. Y'all people be safe out there. Visit our friends at the Mask Republic. Go to luchaloot.com and luchashop.com and use the promo code DYNASTY for exclusive discounts. And welcome back to the Dave Dynasty Show. What a fantastic interview with Greg Anthony. And, of course, the ever, ever enjoyable Mance Warner with his uh, pearl nugget slice whatever you want to call it of wisdom always always good for a good time uh and uh yeah thanks for thanks for joining us um please make sure you visit davedynasty.com you can find links to all the episodes of the podcast they're all uh all 40 whatever there is 46 i believe 47 man i don't know how many there is we're getting up there uh but you can find links there for all of our formats and also links to all of our sponsors including the affiliate links uh, for highspots.com and amazon.com and links to all of our social media make sure you visit all those and follow us and uh, make sure you subscribe to us on youtube we're always putting up new things besides just the podcast um we will be busting out some more wwa classic wrestling that i'll be posting up on there uh, but i've been pulling some personal stuff out of my past from uh, some hpw stuff who's pro wrestling here in indiana and some stuff from uh, the mrw and midwest regional wrestling which was my first go at uh, promoting some shows i've been posting some matches for that so make, make sure you check those out subscribe to us on youtube uh always some fun stuff going up there and lots lots more to come uh always putting new content up there we're starting to put some audio clips some cool things just to you know from excerpts from our interviews just to show people what it is um very very excited about next week's episode it, uh, amazing episode a wrestler Man, where do I even start? A wrestler that is one of my all-time favorites. Uh, one of my favorites when I was a kid. Uh, Love this guy. Still do. And a guy that, man, he's done it all, achieved it all, been everywhere uh, for the most part. And uh, but still does not get the attention and respect he deserves. And we're hoping to help change that. Uh, we have next week a huge Huge interview. I mean, this is jam-packed. He talks about everything. This is going to be a great episode. It's going to be an extra long episode. The interview is spectacular. You are not going to want to miss it. It is with former NWA World Champion Tommy Wildfire Rich. Make sure you tune in next Monday for that. Uh, man, that is that is a great interview, a great episode. Uh, make sure you get out there this weekend. Well, through the week, too. But, uh, you know, every Saturday night, man, there's, there's wrestling shows everywhere. Get out there. Support uh, independent wrestling. Support the wrestlers. Go to the shows. Buy the shirts. Hit up the guys. Take some pictures. Spread it out there. Help you know. Help help. Let everybody know. Hey, and uh, and, and tag us in. I mean, let us know where you're at. What shows you're at. What shows you're going to be going to. We'll help spread the word. Don't forget, send those videos over to us. Let's 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 put some positivity back into pro wrestling. Tell us what you love about wrestling, man. What it means in your life. Send me that video so I can put that project together. Cool, cool, cool stuff. And, uh, you know, it's going to be fun. And, hey, if you are an independent wrestler out there or an independent wrestling promotion and you're looking to help get yourself some exposure and maybe you don't quite, you know, grasp the social media game, that's cool. That's fine. Let me help you. Um, contact me. We'll see what we can do to help you out. I'm just trying to help support, promote, uh, and help make it all a better a better, a better world for us, right? Uh, but you know we can uh, we can start a little little playlist network thing on my YouTube page and get some of your matches out there so that you can share those and get some eyes on those and, and let people see your product. Uh, so contact me, man. You can message me through any of those social media links or you can drop me an email at dave at davedynasty dot com. We thank you for joining us this week. Make sure do not forget next week. Wildfire Tommy Rich 
guaranteed to be one of our best interviews ever. Uh, unbelievable. Unbelievable. You don't want to miss that episode. But, hey, you know, uh, that's all we got for this week. Uh, we'll see you next week with that episode. Until then, be good, be safe, be independent, and keep on growing. Thank you. See you next week. Mm-hmm.